to the Friday seminar. My name is Miguel Tigliosi, a faculty member at the Civil Engineering Department. And today, next week, and the final week of the seminar, we're going to have three traffic signal related talks. And we start today with Ed Smagli for Northern, Northern Arizona University. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, a couple different research projects that uh, we have going on down at uh, Northern Arizona University. Uh, two of them uh, involve Portland State, so uh, there will be kind of a, kind of a local connection uh, to that. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born and raised in the rural Milwaukee, as I like to call it, uh, uh, Wisconsin. I uh, went to Marquette University uh, in Milwaukee to get a bachelor's. Uh, degree in engineering. I knew I liked math and science, but that was about it. Um, so I ended up a civil engineer after that. Went on to Purdue University for uh, graduate studies. I actually went to, um, went to graduate school because I wanted to compete in bowling intercollegiately. I'm a competitive bowler. And Marquette didn't have a program. Um, so like any good engineer, I cross-referenced uh, schools that had uh, established bowling programs uh, with, at that time, I was in construction engineering and management uh, with CEM programs. And uh, Purdue, Virginia Tech, Iowa State, uh, Purdue ended up winning out. Uh, so spent eight years there, got a master's and a PhD, did a two-year postdoc, which I spent a lot of that time bowling, but Darcy was okay with that. Um, and then uh, I was fortunate enough to be hired in the fall of 07 to Northern Arizona University, uh, where I've been there. Uh, been since, uh, was promoted in 2013, uh, and this year I'm on sabbatical. So I've been up in the Portland area since uh, about uh, the end of August, early September, uh, working part time with Kittleson Associates on a couple of different research, or a couple of different consulting projects, and kind of learning how the consulting world works. I teach applied traffic engineering, I should have an idea how it works, um, as well as working on some research. So I'm going to talk about those research projects uh, now. Well, actually, in a bit. Uh, so a bit about NAU. Who has heard of NAU before today? A few hands. Okay. So um, we are uh, 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 the smallest university uh, in the Arizona university system, of, and we have 26,000 students. Um, so we're not, uh, uh, not really a small player, but compared to ASU and U of A, we're much smaller. We're located in Flagstaff, Arizona, a four seasons town, 7,000 feet in the air. We're supposed to get two feet of snow in the next three days, four days down there. So. Um, I teach courses in traffic signals. Uh, I taught a planning course. Uh, I, I taught a CAD course. Uh, so do a variety of variety of things. Um, sorry, I've got a monitor here. Uh, NAU is a bit different than uh, uh, most uh, uh, undergraduate degrees. We actually teach two required courses uh, in highway design, uh, one in highway design and one in, tra in traffic engineering. So. I mean, I guess I read that now for the third time, and we do teach surveying, uh, but we don't have the typical survey course where it's three weeks of this plus three weeks of that plus three weeks of this, which leaves you with, you know, 15 weeks of knowing what's going on but not really knowing how to do anything. So our idea is to have some, some applied knowledge come out of that. My research background is in traffic signals and, and advanced performance measures. Um, I worked with Darcy Bullock at Purdue University, and if you know anything about the work that he has done uh, in his career, it's pretty, most of it's out in the street. It's in some way, shape, or form uh, actually using hardware and trying to improve operations with, you know, stuff that's already, already existing. Um, so a few of the projects I've done in the past at NAU, uh, we worked on developing a module to uh, deploy uh, on ADOT signals to collect data so I can go up to their cabinet or their tech can go up to the cabinet. Uh, take about uh, two, three hours, put this in there, it can actually collect event-based data so I can go ahead and recreate uh, past uh, uh, performance. We did some work with Bluetooth uh, on snowplay congestion uh, north of town. Uh, snowplay, I'm not sure if you guys use that word around here, I haven't heard it, but that's when all the people from the valley come up and play in the snow um, and then create massive traffic jams when the sun goes down. Um, we also looked at uh, uh, speed pe penalty feedback on work zone speed, so telling somebody um, you know, your speed is this, your fine will be that. Uh, and that's the picture you see up here with, uh, uh, you know, my two students, uh, you know, slyly calibrating the radar sign uh, to do that. Uh, we put together a span wire spec for ADOT and also did a little bit of work with, uh, with sign cheating. So kind of done some work, uh, work all over the place. Uh, three projects that I have going on here. I won't spend much time on this page because uh, I'll get into more detail with these. Uh, uh, one is... Uh, 
uh, through the Oregon Department of Transportation. Uh, that's a, a detection uh, project, and I'll talk in detail in just a moment on that. Um, Portland State's a subcontractor for us on that. Uh, I'm a subcontractor at Portland State on the second one, the walkability. Uh, that's funded through NITSE. And then the third project uh, is internally funded through NAU, and it's looking at uh, developing a, a, a sensor that can be powered through power harvesting techniques. So it's self-contained and, and generates its own power to, to do what it needs to do. Right. So the detection project, the idea is that you know, detection sources operate with varying levels of accuracy. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, most would agree that the most accurate detector out there is an inductive loop, presuming it's working. If it gets cut or something else is going on, it's bad splice, it's not going to be that accurate. But when they're working, they're the most accurate, but they do have some drawbacks. So uh, looking at uh, some of the other technologies uh, that are on the market, uh, when we deploy those and then they don't work as well as we'd like them to and they feed bad information into an adaptive control system, what's the impact on the outcome? Right. So a little bit of an example about uh, uh, you know, why this is an issue. Uh, you look at, uh, and my apologies to those of you who are watching online, but I've got a point at this. Um, so when you look at these plots here, okay, um, what I have here are histograms for a video detector turning on and off, right? And if I look at, I'll just focus on this one here because I can reach it, okay? Um, the points you see on here correspond to when the video detector turn on and off versus the inductive loop in the ground, okay? So if the video detector and the inductive loop turned on and off at the exact same time, or turned on at the exact same time, I would see every single one of these points right at the zero line, okay? Um, if the inductive loop, uh, I'm sorry, if the video detector turns on later, I see points over here. If it turns on earlier, I see points over here, all right? And um, the colors are obviously the phase condition, red, red or green. And this is old data. This is 2005, 2006 data. It still tells the story. I, I, you know, video detectors are, are a bit better now than they were 10 years ago. Um, but you think about this from an operational standpoint of trying to, to run an intersection with it. I mean, let's forget what happens if we miss a call or just place a completely false call. Uh, if I'm looking at uh, uh, setting an extension timer okay, for my, my intersection, um, I have, you know, there's a lot of differences in what's, what, what goes on from day to night as well as when the item goes on and off. So if I look here, uh, during daytime, during green, the video unit turns on about the same time as the loop. But during red, it turns on about two to three seconds later, okay? Turning off, the video is turning off just a little bit later, uh, later than the loop. Uh, big, a big concern is when you look at this from day to night, okay? So if I have a really heavily, have a really heavily congested intersection that has to run very snappy so it doesn't fail, okay? If I end up with, if I set one extension timer value for the entire day, I'm going to have very different performance characteristics from, from day to night. Okay, so that's why this sort of information is important so that you can design the system properly or uh, perhaps maybe you choose a different detection source to give you a more accurate result. So this is kind of the, uh, the background information on that, that ODOT research project. Okay, so... Um, at the end of this project, we want to provide ODOT guidance as far as what uh, type of technology to use, uh, as well as where to put detection zones for the different technologies that they, that they choose. Okay? Um, so we're going through a four-step process, and, and eventually we're, so at the end, I really should have that slide here now. Do I have that? Um, I'm going to start from this slide, then work backwards, okay? So um, we, uh, uh, at the end, we're going to perform a cost-benefit analysis using a simulation, okay? So uh, if you can kind of look, look, visualize vSIM, uh, and we're using uh, technology to inform vSIM how the detector calls are placed, okay? So uh, you can think about it in just kind of a rough, um, you know, percentage basis. Uh, if I have my detectors running at 100% of their possible efficiency, so they're, they're extremely accurate. Um, what do my outputs look like, my delay, my, uh, my stops, 
uh, my other metrics, what it looked like when the detection operates at 90% of optimal, 80% of optimal. Okay, so that's a real rough way of looking at that. Is, is, is you know, I, I run simulations with those different characteristics. I look at different traffic volumes, different detector placements, and then I come up with some sort of guidance in a cost-benefit analysis for um, for ODOT. Um, well, how do we get there? Okay. So the models are a bit more intense than just 80, 90, 70, 60 percent. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, we're going to develop uh, error models to emulate those detection changes. Okay. So to uh, develop an error, error models to look at the duration of a false call, uh, the duration of time between successive false calls, same thing for missed calls. Okay. Uh, and the way where that comes from is from our field data collection. Okay. So we're going to collect data at four, perhaps more locations within the state of Oregon uh, to develop those models. So the locations where I want to collect data are locations that have redundant detection. Okay. Ideally, I have a loop in the pavement as kind of my ground truth device. Uh, I'm presuming it's going to work. We're going to make sure they're actually working the way they're supposed to. But then I have other sensors that are on top of that. Right. So then uh, I can digitally record that data. Uh, and then compare it, and then use it to build a model to show what uh, what my chances of, of error are. Um, our sites that we're using for this, uh, uh, we've got one site that's uh, two sites that are managed by Clackamas County. Uh, it, 97th and Lawnfield uh, has uh, uh, three detection sources out there. Uh, it's, it's really it's a dream intersection from an analysis. It's a brand new intersection. Um, brand new loops in the ground. Uh, Autoscope Encore is their most recent product. They're putting a wavetronic matrix up, uh, which is a radar unit that does stop bar. Uh, so we have all those to compare against each other. Uh, Wilsonville Road and Town Center Loop, uh, that has an older detection technology, but it also has loops in the ground. Uh, very high traffic location. One of the approaches, a left turn approach that uh, uh, we're going to uh, record data on. Uh, we've been out there twice, and I think it's failed every single, in every single cycle. Um, so it's extremely oversaturated, so it'll be a nice, nice uh, condition for that. US-20 and Robo Road, uh, that's managed by ODOT District 4. Uh, it's a higher speed intersection. The approach we're looking at is 55 miles an hour heading southbound into town. Uh, so there's a, a combo radar video unit there made by, at, uh, by a terrace, uh, as well as inductive loop, and then uh, they're going to put a flitter camera up there, up there as well. Uh, so we'll have that. Uh, lastly, we're working at, uh, uh, with PBOT. At 122nd and Southeast Division, they have uh, Autoscope Terra uh, and then inductive loops as well. So we'll have a pretty, uh, I mean, we had grander, grander plans when we, we did the work plan for ODOT, but when it came down to it, trying to find locations that actually have this information, have this in the ground, is pretty hard to do. And ODOT is, is working to find another site. They're actually looking to put another site together for us to collect data at. Um, we've designed a data collection module for this. That's uh, a, a, it's a, a hardened field PC that talks directly to the 2070 controller, and then it grabs state information of the detectors and of the phases from the controller. Okay, so it hasn't really been done before with the 2070. It really hasn't been done with the 2070 before. So we're doing that as part of as part of this work. So um, you know, between that and recording the video, we really have the ability to record a heck of a lot of data pretty easily. Uh, we plug into the cabinet. Uh, I'm presuming it doesn't. Shut the controller down, which we'll find out in a few weeks, but it shouldn't. Um, TSSU with ODA is going to test that for us to make sure they're happy with it uh, before we do that. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a pretty neat little data collection device, which I then think we can, we can leverage for further research projects uh, in the 2070 environment, because we've developed this, we have this. Um, it's something that isn't really, uh, really available. It's on the Voyage platform for, um, let's see. All right. So the end goal of this is cost-benefit analysis and guidance to ODOT. All right, so uh, the hope is that uh, uh, they can take this information uh, and then you know, immediately implement it upon the conclusion of the research project. Uh, they are talking a bit about a phase two. They've got some, they'd like some information on how this impacts or how this changes during different weather conditions. Uh, we've planned our data collection for the summer months, uh, so we won't have a whole heck of a lot during this. But, uh, um, but yeah, so that could be a nice uh, additional follow-on project for this. Next project, uh, um, call it the walkability study. Uh, it's got about 15 syllables like any good research project needs in the name. Um, it's funded by NITSI. Uh, Sarisha Kathuri and Chris Monsir are the, uh, the PIs on that. Uh, the objective 
uh, behind this project is to really look at how can we serve pedestrians uh, in a different way that makes the intersection a little bit more accessible or easier for them to cross. Okay? So you know, the way we serve pedestrians now, I push the button and I wait for the concurrent through phase to come up. Okay? Um, depending on what kind of control I'm operating, you know, maybe I'm running a 150 or 180 second cycle and I push the button at the wrong point in time, so I have to wait a very long time to get that. Now, if there's a ton of traffic out there, I'm going to have to wait. Because I want, if I'm trying to cross Barber at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, I'm going to have to wait no matter what. So then it doesn't really matter. But if it's 10.30 on a, on a Tuesday morning, okay, and I have to wait 120 seconds for, for that when there's no cars coming, there's a pretty good chance that I'm going to run across the street and cross anyway. All right. So the idea is to look at these operational situations uh, where we may be able to improve the operations uh, for pedestrians uh, by uh, serving them a bit quicker. So we have a two-step approach to this. Uh, the first step uh, is looking at a simulation uh, software in the loop using the ASC3 controller, um, you know, looking at uh, uh, shorter cycle lengths, limiting coordination, uh, leading pedestrian intervals, and also looking at this idea of pedestrian priority where we run some sort of an algorithm in the controller that will call up that ped phase a little bit quicker. Okay. Um, from there, we develop, from, from that, we develop some guidance as far as where we want to deploy this out in the field. Uh, we've got three project partners on this, uh, City of Portland, who was ready to deploy this six months ago, uh, but have been very patient with us as we work through the steps till we get to we're ready to do it, um, and Flagstaff, Arizona, and Mesa, Arizona. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, partners, I won't say which, uh, in Arizona, when I told them about the project, the first thing they said was, we're not Portland. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that uh, deploying this in Arizona, which is a very vehicular-centric state, um, really lends a little bit more credence to the project as far as it being applicable at other locations besides uh, the Republic of Portlandia. Um, and it really, it depends on how you cast the story. I can talk about, you know, I'm trying to, to do good work for PEDS and make PEDS safer, and, and, and we certainly are. That's certainly part of the project. But one thing we're doing on this work is that we're actually looking at the delay in operational uh, costs and benefits to all the users. So we're not just looking at the delay changes for pedestrians. We're looking at how it impacts delay for, uh, for vehicles as well. Um, I gave this talk out, or a talk on this project at the Maryland ITS conference, and one of the techs in the audience asked a couple questions about it, and you could tell he didn't really agree with the philosophy that we were talking about here. And, you know, I explained to him what we're going to do, and he said, uh, well, you know you're going to have to take out of coordination to do that. I'm like, yeah, I fully expect that. I said, I can guarantee you that I'm going to increase delay for vehicles. But it all depends on what your objectives are. You know, is it, is it a certain time of day where I want this to work? Is there a certain location where I always want this to work, where I always want this to happen because I really care about pedestrians in this part of the city? Uh, again, it depends on what your operational objectives are. And the operational objectives in Portland are often very different than they are in a lot of other cities around, around the country. So. Simulation, uh, we actually have a project meeting uh, after this. Uh, we'll have more updates on it, but uh, here's our uh, simulation network. Uh, Andy in the back row has been uh, working hard on this, um, you know, looking at uh, uh, the different uh, items to, uh, uh, to model. Uh, there's the ASC3 controller uh, interface uh, as well. The algorithm, we're looking at uh, kind of two steps for this. So this is that pedestrian priority algorithm. So the first step is, when do I call that to be active? Okay. When do I want to change the operation of that controller such that uh, I'm ready to give pedestrians, you know, uh, uh, priority? Okay. So do I look at the V over C ratio? You know, do I try to collect that information and decide that, well, when vehicles drop, vehicle V over C drops below a certain threshold during a certain time of the day, you know, is it then time to change that? Um, do I look at something simpler? Do I look at seconds of green per vehicle? Uh, we've kind of narrowed in on just using vehicular volumes for this. Um, we're using a logic processor inside of the ASC3 controller to do it, and we're going to do that also in Voyage. Uh, and they're very powerful, but they don't do math. Okay, so... Um, the challenge with this is trying to figure out from all the different, um, all the different if then all the different objects in the ASC3 controller, how can I set this up so that it'll actually do what I want it to do? 
you know, so I've got to create some bins for vehicular volume. I've got to have some, uh, you know, and, and I have to turn the, have them, ha they have to then turn on alarms to change the timing plan to do all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, so it's a bit involved. Uh, I've got a pretty sharp student who's working on that, and we're slowly moving towards that. Um, but the idea is that, you know, the system will transition into that automatically based on operational data. Okay? And then once I do that, once I get into that, how do I serve that pad a little bit quicker. Uh, the way we're looking at doing that is increasing the permissive window only for pedestrians on phases four and eight. Okay, so uh, the permissive window in, in lay terms is the time, really the time during the cycle when you push the button that the call will come up. Okay? Um, so uh, looking at this in the ASC3 controller, we've got uh, 16 phases, four rings. So our idea for this is to uh, increase the pedestrian permissive window for phases 12 and 16 to have them serve those two pedestrian phases um, and leave the permissive window tight for four and eight for vehicular, so we're only doing it for the pedestrians. Again, this is still, we're working through this, but we feel fairly confident that it will, it will work. Last project that I'm working on here is uh, a self-powered uh, detector or sensor. Uh, this is internal seed money uh, provided by the Office for the Vice President of Research at uh, uh, Northern Arizona University. I'm not sure what the setup is here at Portland State, but uh, um, NEU has a pretty robust seed money program for up to 100 grand for projects like this. And, and as, a, as a PI on this, uh, my requirements are to spend at least one proposal for $500,000 or more at the conclusion of this project. Okay, so um, it's something to kind of get, get some work, work going. So I'm kind of herding cats on this project. Uh, I would say the, the smart ones, um, that's what you talk about, fa faculty are cats. Um, okay, I've got two really sharp uh, uh, engineers. One's a mechanical and one's a, an electrical, uh, uh, Cornell, Chickenell, and Naranjan Venkatraman, uh, that are, are really the brains behind this project. And, and the idea is to uh, build and deploy a prototype uh, of a power harvesting sensor. Okay? So. Um, Three steps to this, experimental program, prototype development, uh, and then a field deployment. Um, so the figure you see uh, on the right, I'm going to try this there. Now I'm going to walk over and point. Okay. Um, the way this works is that there's uh, a magnetic alloy. It's MSMA for magnetic shape memory alloy uh, that is uh, uh, compressed repeatedly. It's surrounded by coil with current, run current running through it as well as uh, there's magnets on the outside of that as well, too. That's my civil engineer, electrical engineering background uh, coming through right there. Um, but the way this works is that um, I compress this at a specific rate, okay, and based upon the rate that I compress that it will produce a voltage. And the idea is to figure out during the experimental part of this program, which I think is my next slide, is to figure out what wire gauge do I need to go through here, what are my number of turns, um, What's the orientation of the core with respect to the MSMA element? Is it you know, perpendicular? Is it parallel with it? Is it you know, at some different angle? Um, and how many MSMA samples? The plot you see on the right side, there we go. On the right side, excuse me, on the x-axis, we've got the bias magnetic field in Tesla, which is the coolest unit ever. Um, maximum voltage output, okay? And then these different traces are for the various uh, different frequencies of compressing that MSMA element. All right. um, so here are a couple of pictures uh, in the lab, and it's a lot of electrical stuff. The MSMA element is behind the coil, all right? and those things are about the size of maybe if you like a quarter size of my pinky, about fifteen hundred bucks a piece to go in there. Um, we have our wires connecting to it. Here's a bunch of electrical. Uh, circuit, because there's just a lot of electrical engineering that goes on behind the scenes of this, because we, we pull this, uh, uh, this voltage out of it, and we have to rectify it, and then save it, uh, and then eventually uh, power something with it. So um, right now, uh, we're about the point where we have an alpha prototype ready to test in the lab. Uh, we figured out what frequency that we want it to, uh, to compress at to get the maximum number of voltage. Uh, the electrical and the mechanical engineer uh, feel fairly confident that we can put this thing out into the street without a lifeline, and within 24 to 48 hours, it will be charged enough to actually start sending data back to us. Okay, so um, 
the, uh, uh, we're only going to deploy, originally we were going to look at bridge sensors as well as traffic sensors. We're only going to deploy for traffic because it really, a lot of the challenge uh, and some of, a lot of the IP that's going to come out of this has to do with getting that, that wheel track to turn into vibration at a certain hertz to actually, you know, to, to provide enough voltage to operate the sensor, right? Um, so we'll just be focusing on, an, on one application, a roadway site. City of Flagstaff is working with us again on this project. They're a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful partner. Uh, we just have to figure out a place to drop it in the road. Uh, we'll wait till snow season ends, so probably middle of April, end of April, before we actually put it out in the street. Don't really want to run a plow blade across of it. So um, let's see. All right. And that is the end of my uh, structured <laughs> presentation. Um, questions on anything or everything? Chris? Is your <coughs> prototype sensor, is that going to do just field counts or? For this generation, I expect it will. Um, we really didn't propose anything specific as far as data out of it. We actually thought we were going to have to have a lifeline attached to it um, to provide power for it, but we've come, you know, we've been, been pretty successful with that. Um, I'm probably, I'm, all the research is exciting, but that's probably the most exciting of the three projects because I can really foresee a lot of different ways to go with that, um, you know, different places to propose on that uh, as, a, as a researcher. Um, you know, it's taking that vibration. So you can think about a bridge health sensor. You can strap a sensor, sensor to the underside of a bridge, and presuming you've, you've, you've designed the casing right, or the, you know, so it will transmit those vibrations into the MSMA element at the right, at the right hertz, um, strap it under the bridge and walk away and forget it, and it will transmit the information to you wirelessly. Right. So that's our, kind of our long-term vision for it. There's a, a bunch of proposals that would come, af come after this before we would get there, but, but yeah. Can you go back to that slide about phases for a pedestrian priority? Sure. Can you explain it? Because some of us aren't engineers. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Alright. So, how much do you know about this? Have you ever seen this picture before? <laughs> okay. So, what this is, is this is a ring diagram. This explains, how, this uh, controls how a traffic signal will typically operate. Alright. Um, we have chalk. Uh, so, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm taking two of the phases, like you can imagine phases, these two boxes correspond to, say, east and west on a street, all right? And I'm adding additional phases to the control structure that will only handle the pedestrians. And I'm going to have different inputs for, to place calls to bring up the pedestrians versus, I'm sorry, to bring up the vehicles versus the pedestrians. Okay. Um, afterwards, I can explain to you how the ring diagram works, but I, I don't want to go into that with this, with this group here. But the idea is that we're going to, as opposed to processing these with the same, at the same time, with pretty much the same information, we're going to use two different sources for it. That's it? Um, so sort of towards the end, you show the picture of that the coil thing the size of your pinky, and so basically that, that gets compressed by the wheels of a car in the pavement, right? So the sensor? Yes. And is the basic idea that that might be more reliable than a loop detector or a video? So we're not anywhere near that yet. Um, uh, well, the, the focus of this, of this one at this point is looking at the theoretical application of this power harvesting technology is putting something out in the field that will use that MSMA element to generate enough power to actually run the sensor. Okay? Um, future research from this would look at different sources for it. So we could look at a loop, we could look at powering other sorts of sensing technology. Um, the, I mean. So it's save on energy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so loop detectors now, I guess, require a feed yeah, they do. Yeah, there, yeah, there's a current going through it. Kind of, uh, almost like a uh, solar powered. It's, it's kind of yes. running by itself. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really the impetus behind this. I haven't even gotten my head around the proposals for the other applications quite yet, but that's certainly one direction in which we would go. Will the car need to be 
directly drive right over that yes. sensor? Okay, so what about the cars that don't drive exactly on that path, say they're a little to the right of the, or to the left? So, so then that becomes a, me a mechanical engineering problem of, of how big do you have the, the footprint for it. Um, you know, the, uh, our, we'll see what happens when we deploy this next month or the month after uh, in Flagstaff. Uh, we are going to, we're going to uh, uh, put some tube outs, get some traffic volumes. Um, perhaps we'll videotape to see where vehicles are actually, uh, actually traveling. Uh, we'll probably pick a facility that has a predefined wheel path, uh, so we have an idea of where that's going to be. Um, you know, it's, uh, we'll probably do a classification count as well to know what kind of vehicles are, vehicles are, are, are going across it. Uh, but that's, you know, part of the prototypical design is to put it out there because we understand we're not going to get all the vehicles. And I, I don't want to put something out there that's this big. You know, this is, you know, if I think of like a water valve, I mean, this is going to be a canister or something like that. This is about the, the size of it, about, you know, maybe six inches deep by about three inches in diameter. Or, so maybe going back to the first presentation, maybe you could just talk a little bit about the, you know, why all the auto you guys are looking at uh, different systems for video data collection and the pros and cons of each one in terms of what you expect might work well or might not. Yeah. Um, so uh, kind of the impetus behind the, the whole impetus behind the project is, you know, when I deploy an, ad an adaptive system, uh, so I put adaptive control out there, uh, and it's expensive in more ways than one. I need a lot of sensing technology. Uh, I need uh, someone to maintain it and someone who understands it. Uh, and, uh, you know, talk to the guys over at PBOT. You know, they have multiple different adaptive systems going on. It's very challenging to, to do that. So you want to make sure that you get your money's worth out of that investment. Okay? An adaptive system will typically... An adaptive system will, eh, maybe you'll gain 5 to 10% more efficiency over a well-timed, actuated, coordinated system. Okay, so if I spend all the money on an adaptive system, but then I use a detection technology that doesn't provide optimum efficiency, you know, I've effectively, you know, I've spent money in the wrong place. Okay? Um, and, you know, the different technologies that, that really we look at for this, we, we have inductive loops, the technology is in the roadway. Um, you know, very reliable when it's operating, but, uh, uh, you know, the big yellow fiber finder, which is one of the guys at the City of Mesa calls the backhoe, tends to find the loops and pull the loops up, and the loops fail. Uh, and then they place constant calls. Um, you know, video, video detectors, uh, you know, the, the cameras, you know, this is a video unit, so is this, just regular uh, machine vision, as, as they would call it. They work on a premise called background subtraction, where they look out at the street, and you've drawn some zones on the street. And then it determines what the street should look like. And then when there's, you know, uh, a vehicle, uh, a pedestrian, uh, or uh, some, a bicyclist, you know, going through that, it would place a call. But there's a lot of things going on between that camera and the street. Okay. Think about fog. You, know, you can't see real well in fog, and the camera can't see a whole lot better. All right. So um, that's one issue with uh, uh, video detection. Video detection has gotten better over the years, but you know, there's still only certain things it can do. Uh, third technology is uh, radar detection, which uh, works on the premise of, uh, uh, well, vehicles moving or not within that, within that detection zone. Uh, it tends to work really, really well uh, for um, uh, tracking vehicles through a dilemma zone. Uh, but it still also, it still suffers from, uh, I'm it also works well just at detecting vehicles. I, I don't, I'm not an expert on that yet. Ask me in six months. I'll tell you all about it. Um, but uh, um, radar detection suffers from the same issues that video detection does environmentally. So if my mast arm is blowing around in the wind, um, if I have a lot of rain, there's a lot of noise going on, so, so I can lose that. So um, the idea is to, to you know, do somewhat of a comparative study between the different technologies. That's not you know, the real and that's one of the building blocks of the project, um, and use those differences in latencies as you, you know, per those plots uh, to get an idea of how uh, a video unit would operate an intersection versus a loop versus a radar unit, uh, and then make those make those comparisons. Electronics, I'm familiar with like having the meat block. So this one is specifically designed for intersection. Yeah. So that's that fairly recent. 
the last couple of years. Um, you know, I um, there's not much out there in the literature on on the matrix, so uh, we're actually we're pretty lucky that that Vikram uh, with at Clackamas County they've agreed to put that up there just for us, so we will have uh, that uh, matrix, the Encore, and a loop all in the same approach, so we can compare across all of them at that at that one location. So, uh, Tom, um, yeah. Trying to get my hands around something you said. That basically, in the old technology, when the old programmable logical controllers that you just set, and they just changed the lights day and night at that time, whether it's one car or not. Time zone engineer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that cost X, and we've been doing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in the last 10 years, we're getting all this stuff. So now we're building these programs that can gather information in real time and do a little bit of analysis with an algorithm and change what's happening to, to adapt to the on the ground. And if we spend 10 times more or 100 times more to get that adaption, but you're saying that the adaptive information starts to degrade the predictability? Well, the performance of the adaptive system will degrade if you don't put good information into it. Right. Yeah. It starts to degrade, so you don't get any more efficiency overall moving traffic and pedestrians through mm -hmm. it. So that's why you're trying to figure this out yeah. to say, why are we spending this money if we're getting no real benefit just because it's cool tech? Yeah, and it's, uh, um, it kind of gets down to how things are funded. You know, so um, it's, a, it's a lot easier to secure funding as a public agency for a new adaptive system for something than it is to secure funding for to maintain your detection, right. you know, or to do other things that, may, that need to be done just as so much or to just to simply retime a corridor. Um, and adaptive systems really, um, there are certain places where adaptive systems are, are incredible. You put them outside of a stadium. Because um, they'll they'll pick up that that, that extreme exodus of traffic, um, you know. But other places where the traffic is predictable throughout the day, say McAdam Boulevard south of, south of downtown, you may not even need it that. I mean, there isn't one down there, but you wouldn't even need one for that situation because it just it wouldn't fit the profile of the flow there. I mean, you think about um, you know congestion or, or delay as, as as you know kind of just like a regular bell curve, and you're trying to you know lop off with with adaptive. You're trying to Reduce the amount of time that the intersection is going to fail. Because okay? if there's too much traffic, it's going to fail regardless. But adaptive can slow the onset of, um, of oversaturation or of, of, of split failures um, by adjusting parameters that are typically static in a regular, uh, regular intersection. Okay. Can you pull up the slide that shows the histograms again? Sure. So uh, what's confusing me about this is uh, I'm not clear which is accurate. Do you know? So, um, yeah, so uh, these are everything, on, all the, the, the plot or the, the points shown here are based upon when the loop went on and off. Okay, so it's based on a comparison of when the video went on and off. Um, what are you drawing? <laughs> um, it's based on a comparison of, of, of here's when the loop went on and here's when the video went on. Here's when the loop went on, here's when the video went on. All right? Um, Okay, so um, the, the premise behind this is that the loop is the accurate one um, and that the video is the one that's, that's varying. Um, and most of the work that's been done in this area, the work done at Purdue, uh, the work that uh, the folks at Champaign-Urbana have done, have all done on the premise that the loop is the accurate one. And you do a little bit of ground testing once you get the system up and running. We'll do that with our ODOT project to make sure that the loop is accurate. But then you just go forward with that because loops are pretty accurate. So, um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, excellent. And related to this project, are you going to be looking at the way these systems perform together, like in conjunction, how the loops in the video can be, you know, maybe used to iron out some of the flaws between them? No, that's not part of this project. Um, some of the different, the uh, so. Those new sensors that are out there, the Iteris has one, Econolite has one, they're, they're combo video and radar units. 
Um, the ITERIS one doesn't combine at all, um, so it doesn't use the video to inform the radar or vice versa. Uh, the Econolite unit, which I didn't think it did this until I talked to the rep several weeks ago, I found out that it actually, there actually is some communication going on between those. So, uh, for example, if, the, uh, if it's foggy and the video, uh, the video fails, uh, it'll lock a call with the radar coming in. Um, so there is a little of that going on. I think that's it's a good area for research is to look into that and to see how we can you know, put this together. Now, these locations that have multiple sources are few and far between. Okay, so, um, I mean, you're looking at um, 20 grand for a four camera system for, uh, for video detection. Um, so, we'd have to see some really serious performance gains to justify the cost of putting, you know, more, 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 more detection at a, at a location. Anything else? Thank <laughs> you.